Thank you, Gunter, and special thanks to you, Thane, for agreeing to be with us today. Uh, I and so many others really eagerly look forward to hearing you. Uh, many of you do know of Thane Rosenbaum, but some of you tuning in from outside this country may not, so I'll say a few words about him. I think he must specialize in not sleeping, because <laughs> I hardly know of anyone who does as much about Thane Ro as Thane Rosenbaum does on so many important issues before us, and they involve really very serious, insightful attention to global anti-Semitism, to terrorism, to human rights, and to what's making a once upon a time liberal culture more and more illiberal, something that we all have to really stand against. He does it brilliantly. Uh, he's a law professor who holds, in fact, a distinguished position at Toro University in New York, where he lives. In addition to his legal teaching and his legal studies and writing, he's a first-rate fiction writer, essayist, um, novelist, and on and on. Uh, Later, we will put in the chat a list of some of his books. I won't take up the time to do that, but I read him all the time in two journals where he publishes month after month. One is the Jewish Journal in Los Angeles. The other is White Rose. Unfailingly, I learn from what he has to say. And in addition, he's just a brilliant prose stylist and I'm always engaged by his command of the English language and how lucid and insightful a writer he is. So Thane, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. It's my pleasure now to turn over to you. Alvin, thank you, my friend. <clears throat> um, you know, I think I should start off by mentioning Primo Levi because I think many people do not know one of my favorite anecdotes about Primo Levi, the you know, very famous uh, uh, memoirist about the Holocaust in Europe. I think his first book is called uh, uh, If This Is a Man in the United States, The Survival in Auschwitz. When Primo Levi first came to the United States in the late 1980s, he landed in uh, JFK airport and flew straight to Indiana to visit Alvin Rosenfeld. Uh, and I just think that that is one of my favorite anecdotes you're talking about a giant man of letters, a treasure in Italy, came to the United States. First thing he did, get on a plane, go to Bloomington, Indiana to visit Alvin. <clears throat> Most people don't know that story. I love that story. It tells you something about the man who leads this important uh, center, Alvin Rosenfeld, and I think you should all know that. Uh, let me give you another reason to think about Primo Levi, which is in Survival Auschwitz, or if you're European, if this is a man, <clears throat> One of the things he says is, I think the literal quote is, um, uh, there are no words to express the demolition of a man. I think or said, uh, I think it's something like that. That, And he goes on at that point for pages to describing uh, that it became aware, that he became aware that the ordinary meaning of words had no meaning in a concentration camp. Words like hungry or scared or cold. Those are words that you use in the ordinary world and have lo lose meaning in the world of the extraordinary, of the atrocious. What we face today, and is somewhat the subject of my talk today, is, is almost the opposite, which is where the words have absolute clarity and meaning themselves. There's no ambiguity about what the words mean, but they're distorted, misapplied, falsified, manipulated. Words that actually have ordinary definitions that are easy to look up, that are in the common culture, have been used to say something else in, in a corruption of the language itself. Uh, it's a bastardization of language, and it has a lot to do with these libels against Israel. Um, we see it more commonly, if you're not interested in anti-Semitism or Israel, just in American culture, and also I think in Western Europe, the ease with which people use the word racism, right? Racism today is pretty much everybody, which is really a shame because if everyone is a racist, then no one is a racist. But we so casually call each other racists. 
Let me just say the following. It is not racist to have questions about and, the seri and to raise serious questions about black on black crime. That's not racist. It's not racist to say that African-American families, like all families, do better if the families are nuclear and intact. There's nothing racist about that. I know that I just said two racist things, but I, I'm pretty sure that those are not racist things. Standardized tests are not racist. Calculus, the math, math is not racist. Uh, let me just, in other areas, Donald Trump may be many things, and many of which are not good, but he's not a Nazi. Anthony Fauci may be many things, and some of those things may not be good, but he's not Joseph Mengele. So you see examples in our culture in which we casually distort, corrupt, and misapply words that mean something else. Uh, apartheid, occupation, ethnic cleansing applied to Israel is simply a way to legitimize anti-Semitism. It's to mask anti-Semitism in a word, in words that would be deemed more acceptable, especially on a university campus. Why? Well, if you walked around on a university campus and said that Jews kill little Christian boys to make matzah, they would think you were insane, or they should, just like villages throughout Lithuania and Poland and Ukraine should have said, you're insane. First of all, you should say matzah tastes terrible on its own. You don't need Christian blood. It's just terrible food. And it just looks ridiculous. It's not even the color of the matzah is not red. Where did this libel take root? And you have to literally be an imbecile to say those words. But those words, those libels, age-old libels, ancient libels of anti-Semitism, don't work on university campuses. They don't work in intellectual magazines. They don't work in the mainstream media. You want to hate Jews? Hate Israel instead. And speak of Israel in the worst possible things that you can say about a country. You can say that they're colonizers, as in occupiers. To be a colonialist is, is much is worse than being a racist in, in a university culture. To be a colonialist, to engage in apartheid, racial separation and discrimination, and to engage in genocide. And so it's not surprising that these words have been used to describe Israel in a way to once again legitimize anti Semitism. You know, um, Joseph Goebbels said if you repeat a lie, especially a big lie, enough times, it becomes the truth. And lying about Jews is pretty ancient, right? I mean, this is thousands of years, Jews being Christ killers, as I said, matzah makers from Christian children, Shylocks, bankers, land grabbers. Land grabbers now is the one that applies to Israel. Anti-Semitism is unique, and I'm sure this topic has come up in the series, in that it's very much unlike other prejudices because it, there's a concrete reason to hate Jews. When it comes to other hatreds of other people, you just hate them. But with Jews, it's different. It, 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 one of the reasons why it's so enduring and so pathological, anti-Semitism, is that it's connected to tangible things, right? So specific reasons, such as the main one is conspiracies, right? Hating Jews, anti-Semitism is all... Uh, is all uh, related to conspiratorial thinking. Jews engaged, scheming Jews, engaged in a global conspiracy to control the world through areas that Jews specifically control, media, banking, financial centers, Hollywood, um, the fashion industry. We know that just from the other week last week from Kanye West, the, the rapper and uh, fashion mogul who invoked ancient canards against Jews. It always is the same, Jewish control, Jewish manipulation, Jewish power, Jewish conspiracy, right? And that's the reason, so that's very different. You don't say that about people of color. You don't say that about Asians. You just hate them. With Jews, you have a reason to hate them. And it's very easy because you're talking about Jews that with, you know, between Shylocks 
people are very predisposed to believe a lie about Jews because anti-Semitism is so embedded in world culture, in Western culture. It's so embedded that if you tell a lie and it involves Jews, naturally you'll, uh, you'll agree with it. Just like your grandfather believed they were price killers, your great-grandchildren believe that they're occupiers of Arab land or they're, they're, they're engaged in apartheid. So this is something that is a pathology in humanity that is not new, that is very longstanding and everlasting and takes different forms. It's ironic that you know Jews are seen as sort of penetrating, infiltrating other cultures. But what really penetrates and infiltrates is anti-Semitism itself. It's how fungible it is, how malleable it is, how agile and facile it is that you can, it's like manna from the universe. You can make anti-Semitism into anything you want. It's got, it's got an end game, an outcome of hating Jews. But in essence, you just find the reason and people will be predisposed to believe it if it means targeting Jews or hating Jews. So uh, when it comes to, um, and so this comes up, this why the euphemisms about hating Jews, you see all the time, and it always goes to the same idea of global conspiracies. So when you hear the word globalist, you know you're talking about Jews, right? You know you're talking about Jews because you're talking about people who are foreigners in every country, wherever they are, they're foreigners, and they're engaged in a global worldwide scheme, conspiracy for world domination. So globalists, they're Jews. Cosmopolitans are Jews. Liberals are Jews. So when you hear those words, you can see, you say, oh, I see, you're talking about Jews. So we've already seen you don't need Israel for euphemisms to hate Jews. You can do it in the United States when we say Jews will not replace us at the Charlottesville rally. Well, that meant Jews are globalists, Jews are cosmopolitans, and they want to bring in other foreigners like them who don't belong in the United States who will replace us. They're not saying that Jews themselves will replace them. They're saying the Jews are involved in a global conspiracy to take over the world, and they're engaged with others around the world in this worldwide bid for, for global domination. And so that's why when you hear the word globalist cosmopolitans, you're hearing essentially euphemisms for Jews. Now, uh, it's interesting to me that when we talk about uh, uh, fomenting global conspiracies and worldwide domination, the irony is that there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And a billion of the 1.6 billion, that's a lot of people, one billion, believe in a strict adherence of Sharia law. I don't know this. The Pew surveys should take the surveys. They go around to Muslim countries and say, do you believe in a strict adherence to Sharia law? And they all, a billion people have said yes, which means stonings, dismemberments, beheadings, <laughs> lashings, killing of apostates, right? That's what we're talking about, right? That, that's the, the, the height of illiberalism, right? And part of that uh, uh, billion are people that believe in an Islamic caliphate. And you know what a caliphate is? Worldwide domination. So you have one group of people that make up a billion people in the world <laughs> that actually avowedly say it's our goal to take over the world through a caliphate. Now you have the Jews <laughs> who represent 0.2% of the world's population, not 2%. I didn't say, I don't make sure. Don't walk around, said Thane Rosen. There's no way. I wish there were 2% Jews in the world. It would be great, but it's only 0.2%. It's essentially 15 million people. I'm laughing because it's so preposterous, right? 15 million people. Let me tell you, Alvin said that I live in New York. It is true that I live in New York. There are 20 million New Yorkers. <laughs> so there are more people, 5 million more people, some of whom are Jews, yes, admittedly, but there are 5 million more people in New York state than there are Jews in the whole world. Try to think about that for a moment before you talk about world domination, right? 2% world banking, right? They're still using the same name, Rothschild. It's the same name. They're not using other names, they still use the same name. You walk around countries around the world, the Rothschilds. Let me tell you something about the Rothschilds. They're on food stamps now. It's been a long time. 
They're they're no longer the Rothschilds, and it's time find another Jewish banker, right? This the, the absurdity of anti-Semitism in the way that it plays itself out. Again, this is if you ask yourself why occupation, why apartheid, why ethnic cleansing, because the old canards are just ludicrous. They've always been ludicrous. You had to be an imbecile to believe in it, right? And yes, the world is filled with imbeciles who are willing to believe it. But again, what's made anti-Semitism more dangerous today is that it is very much adopted by the intellectual left and the progressive left. And although during the Dreyfus affair, you could have made the same argument around the world that people on the, on the progressive more or the intellectual cultural elite had bought into anti-Semitism. Today, Israel is a gift to the anti-Semites. Israel is a gift to the world, not for why you think, because of its startup nature, its high technology, its contributions. No, it's a gift to anti-Semites. Why? Well, because they had to deal with 2,000 years of ludicrous lives, ludicrous libels. And now you got something. Now you actually have a country, albeit very small, 8 million people, incredibly small, surrounded by 22 Arab hostile, for the most part, Arab hostile nations. But this one tiny country now is attributed to extraordinary supernatural powers. The same things that anti-Semites have always said about Jews. You know, there's a very few of them, but they're parasitic and they're supernatural in their power. That was, again, ludicrous. J you know, Jews in the shtetl didn't look supernatural powers. But Israel is confusing, right? This concept of it being a regional superpower with a first-rate uh, military that has, under the new rubric of anti-Semitism, stolen Arab land. Now, you know, there's a lot of reasons for the 22 Arab countries to resent Israel, right? You don't need the Palestinians, but there's many. Uh, the Palestinians are just another excuse. Uh, but you're talking about a country that's only, what, 60, 70 years in existence, Israel, that bloomed the deserts, desalinated the water, was the second largest startup uh, uh, venture capitalist country in the world behind Silicon Valley in the United States, invented extraordinary high-tech and biotech uh, 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 technology, uh, has racked up in a shocking number of Nobel Prizes in a short period of time. And even Wonder Woman is Israeli, right? So there's plenty of resentment, you know, on top of everything, it was even Nobel Prizes and Wonder Woman. So there's plenty of things to, 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 to resent. And the Arab nations, we have to be honest about them, 22 of them, they're all failed in any way that you can measure the success of countries, free speech, the rule of law, independent judiciary, freedom of uh, religion, uh, rights for women, rights for homosexuals. The only democracy in, the in that entire region is Israel, tiny Israel, and yet that's the one country that doesn't have a right to exist. How is that anything but anti-Semitism? One country in the world, we question its existence. It happens to be a democracy, that happens to have a complete culture of liberal government, constitutional democracy. And yet it's the one country, we don't, we don't dismiss any of the other Arab nations that are failed nations. Let me just say, since this is a bookish audience, I, I would hope, 50% uh, of women in most Arab societies don't know how to read. I'm gonna repeat that. In some societies, it's even higher. 50% illiteracy. This is what we're dealing with in these societies, right? Massive unemployment. Again, you know, the violence, the amount of energy that's spent on violence and instead of building states, building nations, you know, building communities is extraordinary. And nobody points to these countries and say, those are where the human rights violations take place. Not in Israel, but instead, again, the three libels occupation, uh, apartheid, and uh, ethnic cleansing. Let me get to the three libels right now. So aside from being a racist, the worst thing you could say about someone, especially on a university campus, 
is that they're a colonialist. We live now in a, in a, in a intellectual uh, culture that rejects colonialism in any form historically. That's why you can't say a nice word about uh, Winston Churchill anymore. You can't say a nice word about anybody who's in any way associated with colonialism. And because this is such a hot and, and, and provocative word, naturally it attached itself to Israel, that Israel is a colonialist country and that's where the word occupation comes from, right? <clears throat> the concept is again, ludicrous, easily verifiable, not 2000 years old, but really since 1948. But the concept of occupation is really just not just false, but spectacularly false. And by the way, I know the word is used often with refer reference to the West Bank and Gaza. I can say as a human rights law professor and a law professor for many, many years, this the biggest mistake Israel has made since Oslo is to normalize the word occupation. It's just not the right word. It's not. Israel is not occupying Palestinian land. You have a land dispute. <laughs> and as a law professor, I'm prepared to argue with anyone that I actually think that Israel has better legal title to the West Bank and Gaza than do Palestinians. That doesn't mean that I don't think the Palestinians should have a homeland on those lands. I do, by the way, I do for many years was believed in the two state solution. I don't believe in it now because I, it's clear that the Palestinians don't believe in a two state solution. I'm not gonna believe in something that they don't care about. They want a one state solution without Jews from the river to the sea. They've made it very clear through their charters, through their terrorism, for their rejectionism, for the rejecting of five peace proposals that would have given them 97% of what they purportedly wanted. So, but I fully prepare to say the Jews and Arabs have lived on that land for thousands of years, but it was never an Arab country. At no point was Palestine a country of its own, run, governed by a distinct people called Palestinians. Now, most people on university campuses don't know what I just said. Maybe I should repeat it. There was never a country in our history, any world history, called Palestine that was governed by a distinct set of Arabs called Palestinians. It's never happened. You, if you talk to students on campus that are shouting down speakers, they think it's happened, but it's simply not true. Never had a currency, never had a government, never had a judiciary, just never had it. In fact, Israel, the country itself and the West Bank and Gaza has been occupied for over 2000 years by a series of other nations. And the occupation ended with the creation of the state of Israel. Why? Because the country that existed before Israel that was a distinct country was the kingdom of Judea. Guess what, Judea, the kingdom of Jews, right? And that country existed hundreds of several hundred years before the ancient Greeks. And when the Jews lost their country, that part of the world became occupied until 1948, until the creation of the state of Israel. So instead of arguing, well, Israel started to occupy Arab land, actually, it was at that time in 1948 that Jews reclaimed the land, their ancestral land, where they became a people and a nation. But that is completely distorted. Instead, we're told that Israel are the colonialists and they're the occupiers. Instead, in fact, in fact, Jews have no ancestral connection to Israel at all. Now that itself is just preposterous. And I'm sorry, you have to be an imbecile to repeat the line. Why? Well, the Old Testament happens to list all the cities and towns and villages in Israel, in the Old Testament. This would be like, I just love this anecdote, Gunter and, and Alvin, I'm gonna love, you're gonna love this. It would be like the United States <laughs> saying that Indians never lived here. And it would make you, Gunther and Alvin, look absurd because you're talking to me from Indiana. What, you're in Indiana and Americans would have to say that all the sports teams named for Indians, all the cities. I used to live in Manhattan. Manhattan is an Indian tribe. <laughs> 
you would have to essentially say it would it's a, that ludicrous to say that Jews have no ancestral connection to Israel is as ludicrous as saying that the people of Indiana came up with that state name out of nowhere. <laughs> Just a coincidence that they used the word Indian. And but there were never Indians living in that part of the world. That's how ludicrous it is. Here's something more ludicrous, even more ludicrous than that. The word Jerusalem appears in the Old Testament 677 times. I think I've counted, so I know. 677 times the word Jerusalem as the home of the Jewish people. Do you know how many times the word Jerusalem appears in the Quran? Take a guess. I'll give you a sec. Zero. Not one time. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. If Jerusalem is so important, if it's such a holy site, how is it that it got left out of the holy book? How is it not there? Yeah, I know, Mecca and Medina. Jews are making no claim to Mecca and Medina. But they are saying that there's an ancestral connection to Jerusalem, which appears 677 times in our book. In your book, Jerusalem doesn't appear once, and yet it's yours. And Jews have no connection to it. The argument is that Jews don't have never lived there, that they've lived in Bloomington and New York and Brooklyn and Brookline and Brentwood and Antwerp and Lublin and Warsaw and Krakow. And they wrote the Old Testament having never stepped foot in Israel. Utterly ridiculous. Occupation, legally speaking, you will sometimes hear people use word the phrase the Geneva Convention, Article 49, as an example of Israel violating international law. Well, Alvin is right. I wear many hats, and one of them is I'm a law professor, which is why I said to you before, it's a land dispute. It's not an occupation. That doesn't mean that it, Palestinians haven't always lived there. And if the Palestinians wanted to rename themselves Arabs from Palestinians in 1948, good luck to you. That's fine. You can call yourself whatever you want. But all there I know is that Jews and Arabs always lived in that land. And if anyone had superior title to the land, it was the people that were under the, under the, under the banner of the kingdom of Judea, King David, King Saul, King Solomon. That was their country. There was no Palestinian nation. So uh, Article 49 was written after World War II of the Geneva Convention. And here's what it says that a country can't invade another country where it has no connection, none at all, no historic and ancestral connection, and then forcibly move its people into that other country in order to take a beachhead to create a foundation of a new country. That's Article 49, and you know what's its origins? Nazi Germany and Czechoslovakia. That's where it comes from. So if you hear Article 49, you should not be thinking Israel, you should be thinking Germany and Czechoslovakia. It's exactly what happened. Hitler took over a country and moved Germans forcibly there. That is not Israel. Israel, as I've said before, has an ancestral connection to the land. Not, they did not invade some other country. And the people that settled in the West Bank and in Gaza, the Jews that settled, were not forced. <laughs> That's the problem. They were sprinting, which is why it was so difficult to have them forcibly removed from Gaza when Israel withdrew from Gaza, I think, in 2005 or 2006, right? They had to be, literally, they wouldn't let go of the foundations, right? They were not forcibly moved. The government didn't initiate this. People flocked, fleed, sprinted to be there. So when people invoke the words Article 49, they're just, they're messing with your head. They believe that you don't know. Now you do know. You heard Thane Rosenbaum. You got it. You're perfect at the next cocktail party. Say, excuse me, that's just nonsense. Utter nonsense. Article 49 of the Geneva Convention has nothing to do with this set of facts. Nothing to do, right? And so, so occupation, an absolute libel. It's connected anti-colonialism. And it fits because Israel now exists. And it's a much easier label than, say, matzah makers that use Christian blood. Occupation sounds better, sounds more convincing, and it fits into the anti-colonialism argument. Let me just check the time because I don't like to run over. Uh, time is it? 
Uh, oh, good. I think I'm okay. I, I, I'm almost done. Uh, apartheid. Apartheid is defined. It's you can look it up. There's a convention, a United uh, Nations convention called Convention on the Crime of Apartheid. It tells you what it means. Now, again, if you don't read, if you want to remain ignorant and you hate Jews, you can repeat the word apartheid all you want. Go ahead. Good luck to you. But it doesn't apply to Israel. The meaning is clear, as I said before. It's not like Primo Levi, where the words can't be used to express the offense, the demolition of a man. Here, the words exactly express what it means. But we've we ignored and rejected the definition and changed it, transformed it into something else that demonizes Jews, right? A an acceptable way to hate Jews. Apartheid is forced racial separation of one group dominating and separating another racial group. It requires first that there be a race, secondly, that they're being dominated, and third, that they're separated. Okay, where is that in Israel? Uh, first of all, Arabs are not a race. They're not a race. There are people, their ethnicity, their religion, but they're not a race. So apartheid just simply doesn't apply. That's the definition. Secondly, in Israel itself, there was an Ethiopian Miss Israel. There have been three Arabs that served on the Supreme Court. There are Arabs that not only serve in the Knesset, but as of late served in the coalition governing government of Israel. Arab parties in a, in a democracy with Arab parties participating in representative democracy. Jews and Arabs sit in the same restaurants. Jews and Arabs ride the same public transportation. Jews and Arabs sit in the same rock concerts in Tel Aviv, and they bathe in the same beaches. Do you realize what an insult this is to the South Africans, the Black South Africans, by invoking the word apartheid, given what I just said to you? Really? Miss South Africa was Black? Really? Black South Africans and white South Afrikaners rode the same buses, ate in the same restaurants. There was a domination. Where's the domination? Now, let me tell you what Amnesty International, again, lies, libels. Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, Jew hating organizations, as far as I have changed the definition. They said now, again, how did they get the right to change the definition? In their reports labeling Israel an, occupy, uh, an apartheid state, they said, well, it's technically not because it's not racist. They admit that it's not racial. But this is what they say. Sound familiar? Ready for this? Hold on to your seats. Arabs feeling unequal to Jews is tantamount to apartheid. The feeling of inequality, the outcome of inequality, you might have equal opportunity but the outcome might not make you equal and you feel unequal. Those inequities are tantamount to apartheid. You know what that means? All of you here watching from the United States, you live in an apartheid state. You live in an apartheid state, I'm sorry. If that's the new definition in order to bring Israel into the apartheid umbrella, then the United States is an apartheid state and so is Germany, and so is France, and so is Belgium, because people of color in those countries feel unequal. And they're not, the outcome for many of those people is not the same as the opportunity, their opportunity might be the same, but the outcome in that feelings, the feelings of inequality. Human Rights Watch and, 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 and uh, inter, uh, Amnesty International literally are saying this. So when you're repeating the canard about Israel being an apartheid, that's what you're saying. They're saying it's not about separation. It's not about domination. It's about the feeling of inequality. And then the last, and then we'll open it up to question, is ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing of the three canards, I, I don't know. They're all terrible. And they're all just misapplied, distorted, manipulated, vicious libels and lies because they're so easily uh, repudiated, denounced, they're so easily uh, 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 defined with great clarity and specificity if you actually look at the definitions. And instead of tossing the label and the libel against Israel, find out what you're actually talking about. 
Because if you did, you'd say, you know what? I don't think that's what Israel is. It may be something. Believe me, Israel is not a perfect country. No country is. And Israel has many flaws, but it is not an apartheid state and it is not an illegal occupier of Arab lands. Uh, but I'll tell you what it's definitely not. It's not an ethnic cleanser. It's not a genocidal state. And if you thought when I said before that apartheid is an insult to South Africa, nothing is more of an insult to the Congolese, the Cambodians, the Armenians, the Rwandans, the Tibetans, the Kashmiris, um, the Sudanese, I think I've got them all. The countries that have in fact have experienced genocide. Let me tell you what you need in a genocide. You need a subtraction of your people. You need to have less people and a significant mass murder of people in order to call yourself victims of genocide. Well, let me start off by saying the Palestinian population has doubled since the quote occupation, double. Genocide is a subtraction equation. It is not a multiplication. If you're doubling, you're not being ethnically cleansed. It's absurd, but people are referring in government, you know, in, in the United States, the progressives, the squad in the House of Representatives constantly use the word ethnic cleansing. It's just not. And somebody, I don't know where the Jewish senators and congressmen, they should be going wild. They should be saying, stop lying. These are not the right words to describe Israel. You want to be critical of Israel? That's fine, but not with libels, not with ancient blood libels that are now disguised as something that sounds legitimate. It sounds progressive, right? A doubled population is not victims of genocide. There are, there have been, there are 5 million Palestinians in the occupied territories. 11,000 of Palestinians have been killed. So think about that. It's 5 million people in Gaza and the West Bank. 11,000 people have been killed. Over 9,000 were avowed terrorists from uh, Hamas, the PLO, Islamic Jihad. So that leaves you a few thousand civilians. The fighting is fought among civilians in what's known as fourth generation warfare where armies do not meet each other in deserts wearing different uniforms, but that terrorists hide among the civilian population. And here's something that's different, something I wrote about for the Wall Street Journal many years ago and has haunted me ever since. The Palestinian people have welcomed the terrorists into their home. They have given their children as human shields. So when you're talking about thousands of several thousand Palestinian civilians killed, that too is not what the Geneva Convention says about civilians. Civilians have to be forcibly taken and moved into the battlefield. The Geneva Convention was never written for the Palestinians. The Palestinians are a new breed of civilians. We've never seen civilians like this, where the civilians said, take my home and use it as a command center and take my children and put them on the roof because MSNBC will love to see images of dead children. And we're willing to sacrifice our children. Now, in the United States, that's called gross parental negligence. And you take the children away from the parents. That's not, per that's not parenting. But instead, this is being treated as Israel as an ethnic cleanser, when in fact, many of the people, who and they're not that many, several thousand, when you're talking about 5 million, over six or seven battles, since the 19, late 1960s, look, 50,000 Americans die in car accidents every year, which means that every Palestinian life is important, obviously, but let's understand that the word ethnic cleansing does not apply to casualties of war when Israel is forced to retaliate against rockets being fired at its civilian population and ends up not willingly and, not, and certainly accidentally and seeking to prevent the death of civilian, disproportionate civilian life, the civilians are not leaving those battlefields because they wanna stay, because they want to be part of the armed struggle and are willing to sacrifice to be part of the armed struggle. So if you look at the numbers and people tend to be more data conscious nowadays, if you look at number, you'd say, well, that's clearly not ethnic cleansing. It's a lot of things but it's not ethnic cleansing. You could take the position 
as a good friend of mine many years ago before he died, Bob Simon at CBS uh, News and 60 Minutes, uh, he had, it was a correspondent for CBS News for many years in Tel Aviv. He and I were close friends, but during the Gaza war, he had read some of my essays. And, and I can end on this answer. And it just gives you an answer, subject, of what do I think about ethnic cleansing? I saw Bob on Broadway, we were both crossing the street and he said, Thane, I know you've been writing a lot about the campaign in Gaza. I, I pretty much know what it says. And let me just say, uh, you know, we don't agree because I have one principle, one principle, you can't kill children. And I paused and I said to him, I totally agree with that. What is Israel to do? And then he said, I haven't figured that out yet. Everyone is pretty sure about what Israel can't do. Everyone is absolutely certain they can't retaliate, they can't kill children, they can't kill civilians, even though it's impossible not to, given the battlefield, the fourth generation battlefield that terrorists have created. But even Amos Oz, who died a few years ago, one of Israel's most famous writers, and more importantly, in some ways, one of the founders of the Peace Now movement, in 2014 was interviewed by German uh, uh, journalists and was asked about the war, and he said, I have a neighbor that's got a terrorist facing my terrorist. He's firing machine guns into my son's uh, nursery. And he takes his own son and puts it on his lap. What am I supposed to do? Amos O's used that anecdote, that hypothetical. And so to somehow take that incredibly complex set of circumstances, impossible moral dilemma for Israel, how to defend its own people fighting against people that the vast majority of whom are terrorists and who are supporting terrorists, welcoming into their home and not somehow take civilian life as casualties of war. Even Amos Oz, the founder of Peace Now, didn't have an answer for that. All right, let's leave it at that. I hope that was somewhat interesting and I'm happy to take some questions and hear some of your thoughts.